Oh, wait. Ah, there he is. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, like I said, I'm going to put uh, Chief Chapinar at the beginning here. Um, and I don't know who wants to go first, Roger or Chief or both, or <laughs> to discuss I, this petition. I can take it if uh, okay. now is the time to yeah. present this. Okay. Well, go first off, it. thanks uh, everyone for letting me uh, be a part of this uh, meeting here tonight. I know I'm kind of springing this on you um, kind of late in the, in the game. I might be a little late for the party, but uh, um, I just wanted to just throw something out there um, for maybe you guys to consider. Um, we, we have recently um, expanded our dispatch center and we are now dispatching for the city of North Bend <clears throat> to include uh, their fire department as well and um, the 911 um, calls that come in to that city as well. And uh, in the process, we are gonna expand or we have expanded our um, dispatch center by an additional console, and then we put another console in our dispatch supervisor's office, which is outside of our dispatch center now. And in the process of doing that, obviously we are a little limited on space, and we really realized the the tightness that we are working in um, uh, currently. And so, I. I, I got to thinking about, you know, how maybe we could uh, eventually get a, a, a building or build something for the dispatch center. And the thought crossed my mind um, to maybe present to you folks uh, of a in the building of the in the library building, if we could um, potentially expand um, a communication center or, or put a room in that building that we could um, use as our communication center. Um, a little bit of thought to it would be it would it would probably need to be about a 30 by 40 room, so roughly around 1200 square feet. Um, which is, you know, that's a sizable amount of room that we would be asking to 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 borrow from the library, but um, a fairly small amount considering going and trying to build a, another building for, you know, 12 to 1500 square feet um, in that that room. Basically, what we would need is it would be a large 30 by 40 room. Um, it can consist of a couple interior walls that would partition off, uh, make about three offices out of that and a small bathroom. And then the rest would be like a 20 by by uh, sorry, 20 by 40 open area for our our actual dispatch consoles. Um, some of the things that maybe that that kind of maybe sort of thinking this direction is we would be needing to look for a place that is outside of the inundation zone, the tsunami um, flood zone, and obviously the library has cited a, a spot that fits that need. Um, the other thing is that I think this may potentially um, add another group of support to the library because it would also maybe bring in those that are in support of a public uh, public safety aspect component to it as well. Uh, may draw in another another group um, and uh, you know just kind of planning out for the future uh, of our dispatch center and our entire community I, I think it could be a, a big selling point um, for some of the taxpayers and we don't know what the future might bring we may at some point um, take on additional uh, dispatch services for our, our community in our county and so it could be a potential um, great location to expand into as well. Um, and then, uh, you know, obviously it goes without saying we're 24 seven, so you'd have someone in your building um, 24 hours a day. You know, it office obviously would draw some police officers there from time to time as well as they exchange uh, paperwork and, and work with our dispatch staff um, that they do on a daily basis. So again, I, I do understand I'm late to, to the to the party here. I do appreciate your guys' uh, time for just listening to this and maybe um, something to kind of chew on and consider. And, and I'm I'm open for any questions if you have them. So, um, oh, sorry, go ahead, Kurt. No, I was just going to say you can ask your questions because you'll have architectural questions. I was just going to say I actually think it's a great idea. You know, we thought a, a lot about kind of a, a multi-use um, um, area out there anyways. We thought about emergency shelters, 
you know, I visit libraries, even little dinky ones like Dora, which has their library with the community center and the fire station. I really love the idea of somebody being there 24 seven to tell you the truth because I've, I've had security concerns. So uh, I think if there's any way we can make it happen, I think we ought to really consider it to tell you the truth. So that's just my opinion. I was going to ask how tall your antenna is. <laughs> uh, antenna on the roof? Uh, you yeah. know, it, it's not super tall. It's probably 10, 12 foot tall is all. OK, I was wondering if we were going to get a tower out here. All right. No, uh, um, we would just uh, so our antenna reaches up to our actual radio site on top of uh, telegraph or uh, on top of California. And so, yeah, our antenna is relatively small to reach up there. Do you need separate access to the building or do you see the ability to come in through the same door as the library and then be off of that? So I don't think we would have to have separate exterior access. I think we can enter the building. However, um, you know, the layout uh, allows us to. Then the actual center itself, we would just put a secure door to meet our uh, CGIS, uh, which is our criminal justice information uh, system um, compliance. And so we would have to we would have to just make sure that that door is secured. But other than that, I think we'd be able to use the regular um, door to enter. Great. Well, most people that know me know that I don't like changing directions uh, when we're in midstream. But the appealing part of this was actually the component of adding public safety alongside of the emergency disaster uh, response capabilities at that location. And really, my end goal is trying to make sure that the voters approve this. And I do believe it gives us another audience that uh, may in turn support this project. It, it does require, you know, another 1,200 square feet of space. Carmen has his hand up, I noticed. Yeah, I was just wondering, I can't remember budget wise, does the police department or the city have any money set aside to potentially fund this if it was separate or is that something that could go towards the matching funds that need to be part of a bond measure or I'm not sure how that works. Yeah, yeah. Currently, we do not have any set aside funds or any plan to really um, expand outside of our, our existing uh, building. Um, so yeah, no, we don't have any. Now, would there potentially be some grant opportunities, um, especially if we looked at, um, you know, kind of like a, a an EOC center, you know, it'd be a communication center, but it could potentially be for, um, you know, an EOC center as well. The county's using the same type of co consoles we're using. We're all becoming um, kind of connected on uh, on our the equipment we're using. So potentially they could use that in an event of a major disaster. I don't know if there's grant dollars on that, but we don't really have anything set aside um, to expand. And that's again why this kind of is, is so appealing is because there may not be another opportunity or option to to look at future growth. Yeah, well, personally, I, I think it's a great concept and uh, a great pairing, especially since we're looking at this building as being part of our uh, natural disaster relief plan. And I mean, City Hall's pretty well set up, but getting there might be an issue if there's, you know, water in downtown or whatever <laughs> yeah. in the event of a major issue. OK, well, I, I don't think we have any other questions at this time. Um, we and we probably want to make good use of the two hours here. So uh, should we move on to? Sure. Thanks, the agenda. Thank you. Chief Chapman, thank you. Thank you. Or you want me to share my screen here? I sure do. Yep. All right.
Okay, to the agenda. Okay, so full agenda for tonight. Uh, I'm just going to start with the schedule update and then turn it over to Sammy if she has anything or Carmen from the city council meeting that was Tuesday, if there's any update from that. Um, and then Carrie's going to talk a little bit about the traffic analysis discussion that we had and what they're up to and the planning cost update summary that we got on Tuesday, um, the program update. Um, I'm going to do just a little um, uh, best practices for laying out a library before we go into some design options, which is the fun part of this meeting that we're actually going to start to see forms on the site, which David is going to walk us through and then end with next steps. So if you go to the schedule. So same schedule that you've seen throughout. Um, I've been working with Sammy to fine tune some of the deliverable um, dates, um, but we did get the planning level cost estimates. So we're on track. Um, we are targeting um, the 23rd for our, of February for our com next community meeting. And um, actually, this is the old schedule. Sorry about that. Um, maybe go to the next work plan because it's more detailed. OK, so we um, are here at steering committee four um, and then we're planning to have a couple work weeks and then have steering committee five, which we're targeting um, Thursday, February 17th, and we can send out some invites for this to see if that that works at least that week. Um, and then the following week we will or is that um, public outreach event and that's really the one where we're going to have some design options for the community to weigh in and actually start to see the form and layout of the building. Um, so the steering committee meeting in advance of that is to um, look at those uh, designs and then also determine what we show in that public outreach event. And then right after the oh, if you go back if right after that event, we'll have another committee meeting where we kind of regroup like we did last time at, after the meeting and talk about what we heard. Um, some other, you know, can talk a little bit more about design refinements and then we'll be issuing our 50% schematic design on um, March 7th or actually March 11th that week, which then that gets um, kicks into getting a cost estimate more detailed because the cost estimate we did um, that just came out is not really based on a actual design. It was just on some assumptions that we made. Um, so that will be um, updated and that takes them about two weeks. And while they're doing that, we'll be um, uh, doing some renderings of the project. So 3D models, et cetera. And then um, our last steering committee meeting for this 50% um, set will be um, uh, to look at that draft cost estimate, cost estimate and the renderings, and then we'll be issuing the report and the estimate. And that's really what kind of is your material for the bond to get to people excited. And then we'll continuing on with the rest of schematic design. So that's where we are in the work plan. Um, and then Sammy, do you have an update from Tuesday? Oh, I think you're muted. Rob, if you wouldn't mind giving an update of what happened. Sure. Um, so basically all we really discussed, are you talking about the work session? Because we haven't really talked about yeah. anything now. Yeah, the work session that on um, Tuesday. Um, so we were just presented with some, basically just with some options on the bond, um, the bond issuance. And we really just got the materials a couple hours before our meeting, so there wasn't a whole lot of discussion. Um, I think most of the discussion is probably going to happen next Tuesday at the city council meeting. Am I forgetting anything, Roger or Sammy? No, I think you're spot on. Yep. Um, I don't think the price came in as a shock, um, to be honest with you. I think it's just a matter of what's the comfort level and what's the best strategy uh, for financing this, um, which would be most appealing to the voters. Right. So that's what's getting voted on on next Tuesday or this coming Tuesday? Is the bond model? I, I think it's both the bond model and um, submitting the, I believe it's the 805. 
uh, to the county. You're basically voting on uh, asking the voters or sending this to the voters. OK. And the target is still for May, correct? That is correct. Yeah, OK. Yes. OK, anything else from that meeting? We can move on. Yeah. Carrie, you want to talk about traffic? Sure. So we talked with Kim, our traffic engineer, along with a few of you folks from the city and our team in civil. These are sort of the three options we laid out for them as potential options that we may want to study, but a couple of them are proven to be a little bit more difficult to build than the rest. So option one talks about going in and off of Hall. Option two talked about going in on Hall and off of LeClaire. Then option three talked about going in and Hall and creating a whole new road to Norman. As is, go back, <laughs> we came to the conclusion that we're going to study Hall and see if there's things we can do with sort of the lane adjustment and signaling to allow it to be to ease the transition coming left onto Newark. And then if there's any potential to add timing or a whole new light that is warranted, then we'll regroup and discuss what it means to add a full on road off of LeClaire and Norman. Our team decided this would be the most efficient use of our time, given that it takes her about three to four weeks to come up with a conclusion. And then if we need to readjust to influence our cost assessment, we'll have some time to incorporate that. Is there any questions on the traffic? Sweet. I actually have a question maybe for Roger. Yes. Um, can you go back to that last slide? So if if option three, could, could we possibly um, contact the armory and see if we can get some kind of easement where the road would be easier to build through there? That's always a possibility. Um, I know it's not being used currently, uh, but we actually tried to acquire it and, and we're told no, they're going to refurb it or they're going to uh, fix it up and reuse it. But um, nothing stops us from asking about the potential for an easement. Yeah, I think um, this is Kurt. I, I think um, David in our last meeting brought that up too, and we talked a little bit about it on the in the traffic study meeting. And um, I thought somewhere along the line we were maybe going to look at that uh, from the concept of, I mean, it costs more to to pave across there and wetlands and stuff. But um, if we could get part of the armory, it alleviates part of the problem of going into that really steep hillside. Isn't that right, David? Because you were worried about the setback from the road because of the hillside as well. That's right. In particular, uh, that corner up there in the northwest, uh, that's a particular problem. And that could be alleviated either by being able to adjust the, you know, Norman to be able to be, you know, um, inboard of the property. You know, so you take the western part of the armory property to, re, you know, shift the road over, or you're taking the northern part of the of the armory um, to shift the road over. And I do know there are um, just from having designed some armories, there typically are setback requirements that need to be secured uh, for you know any kind of blast protection. And um, so I, I think there might be it, that might be uh, challenging. <laughs> to, yeah, they, to get exceptions to that. Yeah, they yeah. do have an underground um, range at that location. So that may play into it as well. Either way, I think what kind of what, what uh, our strategy is that Carrie outlined is to really focus on just getting the existing kind of whole street intersection uh, studied and um, that there may be some alterations that we can make to how that intersection works and the lanes that are out in the middle of the street that can make it safer. Um, we actually in the meeting realized that there is a left turn, dedicated left turn lane into that residential parking lot. And 
that that's actually complicating uh, left turn exit for that major kind of public intersection, um, which you know could otherwise be a safety lane. In other words, uh, the traffic engineer noticed that and and was surprised. So it um, you know there's a lot of stuff to untangle there, but I think that's strategically the first place to look is to see what we can do to improve that intersection as it is before going on to doing all the work to fully you know investigate the other opportunities. Awesome. One thing to consider, and I guess um, I'm going to have to know this rather soon, if if the city and, and, and the steering committee is going to pursue adding on the um, the emergency call center that Chris presented, um, that's our traffic engineer needs to know that. Mm. So um, she's not out here to do counts yet, but she is running models. And I, I can't say I know exactly what she's doing, but I know she's going to want to know that. Yeah, it will add a few trips a day, but I think it's going to be actually fairly small when you consider that um, the people you have on staff is three or four at a time uh, per shift, and they're working 12-hour shifts. Agreed, agreed. I just want to take into account that um, just so we are prepared should, should anybody question it. Sure. Would there be any difficulty with just having her in, include that for now as a kind of breakout for the traffic study in her model? I'd have to check with her and probably get some more information from Chris. I know he mentioned there would be police officers there as well, so I'd have to get a feel for that. But I agree with Roger. It's 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 low volume, but we just want to make sure we account for that, the daycare and the um, park as well as the library. I think Kurt has a point. I think you just go ahead and build it, build it in, uh, since it's going to be a low number. I doubt that it would be more than 20 trips a day, but um, it'd be best to have it in there. I can do that. Good point, Jennifer. Anything else on traffic? Sweet. So some of you may have seen the cost estimate. This is just a sort of brief summary of it. And we are landing at 23 million nine hundred twenty two and forty five four hundred and fifty one dollars. I wanted to go over some of the assumptions we made to get us to that estimate just so that we're all on the same page. And we sort of wrote a summary based on having a two story building. It's mass timber CLT, a lot of you know localized wood. It'll be really well insulated building envelope with a high efficiency mechanical system in the hopes that we can get close to net zero if not make that goal. It also included some of the right of way adjustments on haul. We wanted to just add that in and have a line item for it so we can track it as the total cost. And then one of the things we wanted to point out is that it currently has a 7% design contingency and typically at this phase we're using we're used to seeing a 10 to 15% range and that's just something we want to make aware to the group it's something that could also just wiggle out as we start working through the massing and the process and refining some of these numbers such as ff &E and sort of that aspects of the project Laura, David, is there anything I'm missing that you wanted to add on the cost estimate? Um, just, I think that 10% for FF&E is high. So I think some of that percentage could come out to give us a little bit more design contingency that, and still be around 24 million if that's kind of a target you want to keep. Awesome. Well, is okay. there... I'm, I'm not sure if we're going to share out the cost test and I'll leave that up to Laura and Jennifer to decide. Um, but it seems that we are on top target for our, our budget. And this. Um, go. Sorry, Carrie. Yeah, and I was just going to ask, you know, in light of if the um, dispatch center was to go out here, 
if it were 1200 square feet, it could be half a million dollars or something like that. Um, is that the kind of thing that you would expect you'll, you'd be willing to, like you would go out for a little more bond, but feel like you're getting the advantage of having that as part of the program. So it's going to be a little more expensive for the, the bond language, but you get the story right? Or are we just trying to, are we going to take 1200 square feet out of the program to get it to work? Does anybody have an idea about a strategy for that? This Roger, and I was assuming that we would not take it out of uh, the library uh, space. I was, and I had made the same assumption that it would be somewhere around a half a million dollars. Currently, I think we're, the council will probably be considered going out for a $20 million bond uh, with hopes that the, the remaining amount of money can be raised locally. And obviously there's some, there's a good portion of that's already been uh, raised through uh, at least a large donation, but there are other costs involved. Uh, and then we of course have uh, urban renewal that's committing uh, some dollars already to the project. Yeah, I we didn't talk about that the traffic study, Roger, but that's where the urban renewal might come in on on this chart that's on the screen right now, and maybe some of the right of way adjustments. Is that where the urban renewal would come in? Well, I I, I think urban renewal is uh, committed to at this point in time up to a million dollars for uh, design. Okay. Yeah, the the foundation currently is about um, two point nine million dollars, uh, and we really haven't started a, an additional capital campaign on top of that. So um, uh, that's that kind of gives you an idea where we're at uh, right now. Okay. Um, I have some questions about the planning cost estimate, but after hearing the presentation and knowing you're going to go through all this again and refine it based on the other things, maybe I'll just hold off on on those um, to bring them up at at that time. But um, I had some particular questions about it, but um, rather than suck up all of our valuable time tonight, I can uh, address them then. OK. Yeah, let's put a pin in those and come back to them for sure. I think we briefly touched on the program during our community meeting, um, but I wanted to show you guys that we've refined it with Penny to get us back down to the 31,540 total gross square foot of the building. And here on the side, you can kind of see what those program elements look like in relationship to each other. And we will be using this as our sort of, as we launch into the building outlines further in this presentation, you'll start to see that and those relationships take place. Great, thanks Carrie. And I will add um, just a note that um, if you're wondering as we get, cause you'll see these colors and these blocks kind of show up in the diagrams we show you. Anywhere you see this yellow color and it says public, that includes kind of the entry lobby, um, some circulation around the lobby, and it also is just raw area that will account for the restrooms. Correct me if I'm wrong here, Carrie, but is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And it has the Friends of the Library bookstore. And that's a, that. right. And you'll see in the diagrams that that's a level, that's a kind of fine grain level that you are not going to see tonight. What this is kind of doing is saying, we just got to fit all this program on the site somehow. And so you, when you see this, there are finer grain elements of this that are not showing up yet. Just want to point that out. Okay. And uh, Laura, do you want to walk us yep, through? Yep, sure. Some so before we um, start to show some of the diagrams for your site, um, I thought I would just talk through a couple basic planning of library um, methodologies. So this is, I'm using one example of one of our projects, which is this is a library that we did up in Alaska in Juneau. 
It's about 18,000 square feet, um, all one story. Um, and so smaller, but all the components are similar. Um, so David, if you can just point as I go, the main entry door, you come in um, in this location to a nice foyer space, then the community re room is right off of that. Um, and then there's bathrooms to the south of that. And then behind there is kind of the staff admin um, back of house stuff. And then up in the corner up north and out, uh, there's um, the mechanical area. So that's kind of hidden there. Then as you move um, into the library space, um, there's a separated teen area. Um, and then the main point of service circulation. And then there's the children's area right um, behind that. And then you have a big open space that's all the adult stacks and seating and computers. And then along the one wall, we've um, located all the kind of little study rooms and conference rooms. So if we look at some of the planning basics that we implemented, if you go to the next, um, the first is about entry. So we want to make sure that there's um, a separate staff entry and administration, that they're not coming in the front door, that they have their own door, um, and that there's a, uh, and that that's for deliveries and pickups as well. And that we want to make sure that that door is really um, not confused with the main door. So we want the, you know, people coming to the library to have a clear, this is where I'm going and not be like, oh, is it that door or this door? So in this library, we sort of tucked it around the corner. So it's very clear that you're coming in the main entry. We also want to try and locate the book drop right adjacent to that main entry. So as you're coming in or you can park and drop off and that that drop really wants to go right into the staff area because that's where they're going to process the books and return them. Um, so that's about entry. And then if you go to the next. Then we talk about um, the kind of after hours secure zone. So ideally we want to have the meeting room, the big community rooms accessible after hours so you can lock down the library and still have access to the meeting room and the bathrooms. So this is how we did it in this library. We have a separate um, glass wall that um, separates the kind of bigger library space from the foyer and meeting room and bathrooms. So it's really super easy for after hours access. If you go to the next. And uh, we also want to have a really flexible meeting room. So the way we did that in this library and you can see in the picture is that this wall and if you point to the wall in the plan is just a big glass sliding wall of panels. So what that allowed is um, obviously you can have it closed if you have a meeting going on in there. But then if you go to the next, if that can all be pushed to the side and that meeting room can become twice the size, so you can have overflow events and you actually kind of go into that foyer space. Um, or when there's no meeting happening, you could open it and people like generally coming to the library could go and sit in there and use it. You could actually rearrange the furniture to more of a lounge or you know, different way um, that people could could use that space. So just really trying to keep it really flexible. And then if you go to the next, um, the next thing is about um, oversight and views. So in this library, we had to um, be able to design it so one or two staff people could be there and that's it. So how you can have oversight and just make sure you're seeing people coming and going in the library. So the main point of service in that kind of knuckle space, if you go to the next, from that point, um, you could see into the teen space, you can, because it's glass wall into the teen, you can see back into the children. You can see over to the small conference study rooms off to the side, and you can see all the way down to the end of the library. We kept all the stacks, if you see in the little image up on the left, are all at 60 inches, which is what we have planned, I think, for three quarter of the collection in your library. So you get the really nice ability to have sight lines over top of that. Um, down throughout the library. And then and then so then these are just other pictures of you can see into the teen room. Um, so they have their own space and it's partially enclosed, but there's good um, oversight of them. And then the, you can also see into the um, study rooms because it's all glass um, walls into them. And then lastly is just acoustic zones are really important to think about. Um, so what's noisy and what's quiet. So um, obviously the teens are really noisy. You go in that teen room and when they're gaming, it's just booming. So you want um, 
you want that to be acoustically separated as do the children have their own space. Um, um, and then what we did in this library is for a quiet area for the kind of adults, we just put them at the very far end. So just naturally the busyness of the library is more up by that point of service and the noise of the kids and people coming and going. And by the time you get out to that end space with the fireplace, it's quite quiet and it just, it just, the reaction to that space is just to be quieter. So um, just these are just things to keep in mind when you start to see the relationships form in our diagrams and how we've tried to relate things. And we'll be going back to these as the plans um, get more detailed. And I'll pass off. I think, David, are you going through site or Charlie? Charlie. Charlie. Carrie. 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 Go, Carrie. <laughs> Charlie's not feeling well. Um, no, sorry, Charlie, just added you on your sickness. Um, wetlands. So now that we've sort of refined the site, we're really zooming in, trying to make sure that we gather all of our known constraints to really site the building appropriately. So here we've highlighted the known wetlands, which is that sort of crosshatch. And then looking closer at the site, Charlie sort of pointed out that there is a bunch of standing water up on that north part of the site and we think it could be a potential wetland and we are working on getting that delineated that way we can know exactly where it is in the site in relation what we need to do to build around it um, we've currently lined it up with where we think the lake level is and assume that would be the most appropriate region for us to designate as a wetland so carrie it wasn't on the original wetland no. map that we got right Okay. No. And then we're working with Pacific Habitat and I kind of pointed it out on the phone. And he was like, oh, yeah. So <laughs> <Miss that. laughs> yeah, there's a lot of water there. So and, like, I, yeah, and, and regardless, just the idea of, you know, when we build our building, not wanting to build it in a spot that's lower than the lake. Is kind of where we're coming at that. Yeah, from. it seems appropriate to set the ground level above that lake line. Um, these are a couple of the general setbacks. We have a 10 foot setback from the north property line and then a 50 foot setback from the lake for our riparian buffer. There is some nuance there that allows for some elements to get pushed into that, but we do wanna, we do feel like it's an appropriate strategy to repair it and make it part of the lake experience. And then, this is sort of a, you've seen this diagram-ish before, we've refined it for this site specifically, and this is showing that there's a bunch of filtered forest views on the west side of the ridge, and then these lake views on the east side of the ridge. And you'll notice some of the schemes really want to take advantage of both in an, um, in an ideal situation. And I think also just noting that the lake views are typically over, not all of them, but sometimes they're over the parking lot. And last but not least, parking. There is a lot of parking required for this site, and we are working on strategies with the city to see if we can combine a bunch of these different uses, the existing park use, the Bright Learning Center use, and then the library itself. The library alone, without adding in the dispatch center, requires 52 stalls. That will go up with adding the dispatch center. And we are currently finding, as you'll see in each scheme, it's, it's a bit of a struggle to lay those delicately on the site. Right now, in all the schemes that are following, we are assuming that we want to accommodate all of the existing parking as is, maybe refresh it, allow it to repair the buffer and incorporate it into our libra library parking, but we'll assume that we'll hit the 95 stalls total. Yes, Roger. I think um, two things. On the uh, parking lot by the um, site owned by the hospital, we have half that parking lot uh, for us. But the other thing that's going to come up next week, and it came up in the Parks Commission, I believe last week, is there's a an outfit that wants to fund a non-motorized or a kayak launch 
in that park. So that in itself, though, adds maybe some more traffic and more parking issues that uh, could make it even tougher. So I just wanted to bring that up. I know it's going to the council next week. Uh, I have no idea on, on usage what that looks like. Um, I'm, I was just curious about the one comment you just made in particular about um, that you that the city owns half of the parking that's in this lot. Is that what you said? That's correct. At one time, the city owned uh, the building that's there. It was called the neighborhood facility building, and we owned all the parking. When we sold off the building, uh, and we could go back and look at the deed um, on that, but I believe that means we share the parking now. Mm. Okay. Roger, um, this is Jennifer. Um, yes. So I may have misled our team, but on our GIS, it shows the entire parking lot as being owned by the city of Coos Bay. So I'll, 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 I'll follow up on that. It, yeah, it might be just helpful just to pull up the deed of the uh, building. Um, okay. And then see what that says, but it, uh, I recall the last time we looked into this. Um, that uh, when we were looking at for a dog park. Uh, to the west of that parking that we were uh, we had. were told that we owned uh, or had use of half the parking. OK. Uh, I'm just going to interject a comment here too. It has nothing to do with who owns what parking lot, but I'm assuming we're going to use some of those um, uh, parking spots up on the top that belong. But we're calling the BBLC parking lot. I, just as you design this, I'm, I want to make sure we take into consideration how pedestrians would get from there to the library, because that road that goes down to the lower parking lot is not very wide, isn't lit doesn't have any walkway on the side of it. I don't know if they would access the building from some trail on the top, but knowing that the library will be open at times when it's dark, uh, just how pedestrians would get from that upper parking lot to the library is something to think into the plan. Yeah, it's really good, Kurt. Thank you. We'll also be uh, bring, bringing a sidewalk all the way in from the, uh, the right of way. A long haul. One thing that we are working on is trying to figure out the required parking for the park itself and the child care, because I think that'll help us delin delin delineate how much of that sort of onion parking lot we can claim for library versus the park. I think in our mind right now, we're trying to be sensitive to how much parking is truly needed for the park and the library simultaneously and as we dig in further with that in the city that'll help us you know pinpoint which use is appropriate for that onion and and i think the way that um and the way that we're approaching this right now as carrie tries to learn more about the legal you know amount of parking that we have to provide by city code I think we're also we're anticipating that that is going to be less than what is actually needed. And that's partly because there aren't even necessarily, as far as we know, any standards for the park saying how much parking you'd have to have required. And I don't know, Jen, if you could help us with that or. But regardless, I think what we want to do is find the right amount for the uses that are out here. And right now, what we're doing, just by assuming that we're just counting the library, you know, kind of by code, that may actually end up being less than what your peak use would be. And we're just going off the anecdotes that Sammy shared last time about how all the parking around the current library can fill up for some really big events. And what we're trying to do is assume that um, you know, a big event at the library that there could be some push and pull that we ideally we're not ending up with exactly the same moment when, you know, the childcare and the park and the library are all having their biggest events at the same moment, which I think is probably a pretty safe assumption. So 
that that's sort of how we're operating right now. Just so you know, we're we're everything you'll see today is based on this code requirement for the library as a standalone, and it's not taking any advantage of sharing. Jennifer has her hand up. I'm sorry, I don't remember who on the hacker team said this, even though it was just a couple of minutes ago, but someone mentioned that we are going to be installing sidewalks along Hall Street from Newmark um, North. And while we certainly can do that, I just I just want to point out that we have the paper right away. Absolutely, we have the room to do it. But you're talking about we're going to be working in people's front yards and tearing up landscaping walls and sidewalks. Um, so I just wanted to put that out for the steering committee. Um, I, I I think pedestrian access is a great idea. I think we should do it, but it's going to require working in people's perceived front yards. Yeah, that was Charlie, and I made that statement based on the belief that if we put public transit out um, at the main road, that we'll we'll need to give them a a walkway in. Yeah, and I think this was discussed um, when we met with the transportation um, committee, and and I, I think it could go both ways. Um, I, I'm not sure, you know. I, I think it was discussed how really how much pedestrian um, traffic are we going to be getting off of Newmark, and is sidewalks necessary? I'm not the decision maker on this. I'm just putting this out there. Thank you. This is Rob. Um, it seems to me like bus service, we could put a stop in closer than just off a of new mark. I think they would agree to that. And secondly, it should be known that we've already got some negative feedback from the residents on whole. Mm -hmm. So I would like to not add to that fire if possible. I, I agree with this is Kurt. I agree with that, Robin. I could see the 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 bus, the public transit coming in and using that upper parking lot as a loop. You know, they could come in, drop off, and loop right back out again, and not even go down to the bottom parking lot if they were amenable to that. So that would be a win-win. OK, uh, we have some time at the end too, actually to talk about some of those issues uh, like that we've undercovered uncovered with um, some of the residents and some of the other special interest groups. So um, is that OK if we move into the design options phase of the presentation? OK. All right. So uh, what we've been busy doing is taking that red lozenge that we've been showing you up at this uh, corner of the site. And we've actually been taking the next step with that. Um, these are not buildings that we're showing you today. They're more or less just very crude um, diagrams that'll help understand uh, some different heights of buildings and how they might uh, integrate with the ridge that's there now so that we can understand issues around access uh, and parking and how it would affect the whole site. We're gonna walk through four options today, A, B, C, and D. And um, e each one takes a, kind of a really different approach, both to how the building sits on the site, and then we'll be showing you floor plans for what the implicate, uh, floor plan diagrams based on that programming image that we showed you earlier that show where basically you could uh, put the different spaces of the library. So they're not floor plans, but they'll they'll provide some relationship that way. So um, without further ado, I'll kind of dive in here. Um, and I think it's going to be best to sort of take clarifying questions probably as we go so that um, you can kind of get familiar with the diagrams and how they work and what we're showing. Because it's fairly complex to draw these because of the different levels and the way the topography of the park is working. So just to orient you, uh, the way that we're going to show you these options is that the first page we show you is going to show a lower level and an upper level for the library with these program spaces laid into it. So you can kind of see where on the site those program spaces might go. And so on the left will be level one, which is down at the lake level, and level two, which is up more at the ridge level. 
And then the reason there's this kind of funny kind of white cut on here is because when we show the library down at level one at the lake level, we're also only showing the parking and roads that are kind of down at that level as well. And when we go up to the second level, we're showing the parking and site improvements that are associated with that upper kind of ridge level. Uh, and then after this, we have some three dimensional diagrams that will look like this and it'll have the key plans. So I'm gonna, just gonna start kind of walking through this one for you. So, and in all these, you'll see us kind of working real hard to get everything to fit kind of down on this lower plateau. Uh, as far as parking and the building go. So uh, starting, let's start up, up at the upper level at level two, which is where you'll arrive from. So right now, this is the entry road uh, as it is kind of coming in uh, now. And what we're proposing here right now, the road goes down this way where my cursor is. But what we're proposing is that we actually split it off and regrade a portion of the hill for that road because it's going to allow us to get a more efficient kind of loop of parking and actually get more parking stalls down below than if we just are coming in where that road lands us uh, now. And in all of these schemes, we're working to avoid, um, I believe this is the pump house and a utility there that we're really trying hard to avoid moving. Am I, is anybody, is that correct? Anybody have a, a counterpoint to what those are and what they're used for. There's also a public restroom building there. OK, thanks, Charlie. So uh, the way the site works, yeah, you'll come down um, and you can engage this loop of parking uh, and then come back up. And the southern part of that parking you can see is pretty much like that, like the existing parking lot is now. But um, we have uh, reconfigured the northern section um, of the parking to work with the different kind of building configurations. Um, on the, uh, so once you've come down, I'll go back to this level one. So down at the lower level, you've kind of come in and you've parked. We put all the ADA spots and uh, loading kind of up near the library. And in this scheme, what's unique about this scheme compared to all the other ones, is that this is a one story library. We knew that was really <coughs> important um, to this group for operations. And this was um, one way that we found that we could stay out of that wetlands, uh, not the, the undesignated wet area, I call it a wet area, uh, try and stay as much out of that as possible, but also fit uh, within this site and get all the parking to fit. And we actually got really excited about this one because what we realized we could do that could be a really wonderful experience is that we could actually have that one story library actually go through the ridge. Uh, and what that would do is that um, when you arrive at the ground floor, the red arrow would represent an entry. You would come into public space that would have the restrooms uh, affiliated with them and uh, primary service desk, uh, the staff, uh, would be right off of that. And then also the community room could be right off of that main public area. So that that's like Laura showed, that could be that kind of, you could lock that down after hours and everybody could use the community room and the restrooms. This word support, that's the dark gray, that's like building mechanical systems and trash and all that. And that would seem funny to have on the, what is the public face of the building, except that you're actually into the hill by that point. And so, um, uh, this whole section, this whole wall here would be a retaining wall that the library would kind of be slicing through the hill um, this way. As you would come into that public space, that, that kind of arrival and main service desk, you would split the library at that point. If you go right, you could go to the children's area, which have a great, you know, ground level view kind of out, you know, into the beginning of the pathway that goes around the park. And if you go to the left, you would be in the adult space that um, also is passing through the ridge. But the thing that's interesting is that the ridge is dropping pretty quickly this way. So while the earth might be high on this side where the kind of this kind of dark support space and staff uh, are, it actually is quite getting quite low by the time it gets to the adult uh, side. So that this whole wall could really be all windows kind of facing 
into um, into the park and into the trees. And then meeting areas and teen could be associated and kind of be off of the adult space. And maybe the most notable thing about this might be what's happening at the upper level. So we were proposing actually this upper level might be able to be an accessible uh, green roof that um, you could, uh, when you arrive here, you could park at both, you can have a choice of parking at this upper level uh, and then going down, we would, we would put a really great kind of walkway or steps or something that could bring you down to that main level and that main entry. So you could park either parking lot and still get to that main entry, but all your ADA spaces would be down below. And at the end of that would be, you could access and go out onto this rooftop that would have an overlook over the lake and into the woods. And you can imagine, you'd, it's kind of the one big flat spot that could programmatically really augment the park and provide a really great opportunity for outdoor uh, events. Because flat spots are, are a little bit of a premium out there, we found. Um, the way this would look uh, visually, on the left are just those two plans with the lower level plan, um, the lake level plan, I'll call it down below, and then the ridge level plan up above. And so uh, this would be the view, here's the road off to my right where my cursor is, kind of going down to parking. And this would be the upper level uh, parking that could lead right out. You can imagine if you wanted to have some kind of big event out here on the rooftop, um, everybody could be parking here you know, for that, or they're parking for the library and then using the steps to go down if the lower lot is, is full. So you could just kind of do that loop. You know, it's all full of parking and you could park up here. And we're showing these, um, obviously we're not just gonna have a big wood block for your library. You'll have windows and all that stuff, but this is just, we're not there yet. Um, this is just kind of showing the shape of it, but you can see how um, it would actually go through the ridge. And the really wonderful part about that could be that you're kind of getting both experiences. You're getting this part that's very public and is facing out to the water and is very you know, vibrant and has this big view across. And then as you move through the library into the adult section, you come into this whole other kind of experience of the park, which is the kind of tree canopy and a little darker and shadier um, aspect of it. So it kind of bridges those two experiences in a way. So that's a lot. I'm gonna pause there and see if people have any clarifying questions at this point before we go on. Um, uh, it's not a clarifying one. I like the idea of it being one story. I mean, I like the way that there's parking up on the top. I think those are great design concepts. Um, I, I, I see it probably limits maybe the view to the lake of some of the other designs because there's just basically a east facing end that's going towards the lake. I know you could probably see some of it from the parking lot area, so that maybe seems to be a little bit of a negative. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. I like the idea of the flat space as long as nobody falls off the roof. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. For sure. Okay. So Same. I, mm -hmm. I do have a question just from a, like a long term maintenance. Have 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 you have you designed a green roof in in you know areas that receive sixty plus inches of rain? Have they been in 